you. My name is Martin Cooper. Call me Marty. Uh, I uh, introduced the first uh, cellular phone, uh, handheld cellular phone, in April thirty, uh, April third, nineteen seventy-three, uh, and I'm presently uh, part of a group called Data LLC that explores uh, new technologies and tries to make trouble. Yes, and uh, you know, I know a lot of the students have have read about your bio. Do you mind if we just let jump right into uh, asking questions? Is that okay with you? I would love it. Okay, I have a, a question from Elias in France, and um, Elias, you should be able to ask your question. Go ahead and unmute whenever you're ready. Um, yeah, hi. So first of all, I just wanted to say that it's a great honor, and I'm really pleased to meet you. So here's my question: uh, How do you thing that you affect our, our world and how do you feel about it? Sorry, to, it repeat it. How do I uh, feel about, you, about what? About the influence of the invention of the cell phone because it's, it's touched so many different facets of our lives in every single corner of the planet. What do you think about, yes, I got did it. you ever imagine it being that big as far as the influence? Well, first of all, uh, we do, uh, when we uh, uh, introduce that first phone, uh, that someday everybody would have a cell phone. Uh, in fact, we had a joke that we told that someday when you were born, you would be assigned a phone number, and if you didn't answer the phone, you would die. So that was pretty clear that we never imagined that there would be uh, in every phone a camera, uh, a connection to a thing called the Internet. The Internet had been invented in uh, 1973. So. Uh, uh, that part of us escaped us then. Uh, now I think uh, we're starting to understand what the potential of the cell phone is. And I have to tell you that I think we're only at the beginning. Uh, I think that the cell phone as we use it today uh, is suboptimal. Just think about the fact that uh, when you want to make a phone call, uh, even the term phone call is kind of obsolete. Uh, you take this flat piece of plastic and hold it up against your round head uh, in the most uh, uncomfortable position you could imagine. And I, I don't think that's an optimum phone at all. Uh, I think that the phone of the future uh, is going to be custom made just for each individual. You know, that every person in the world is different from every other person. Uh, and I think that the phone uh, ought to be accommodate people uh, to uh, precisely to their personality. Uh, and uh, with our solution to that today is they say, oh, well, you can customize a phone. All you have to do is get the right apps, and you, uh, which means you go out and select among uh, three or four million uh, apps, uh, which is, of course, uh, totally ridiculous. Uh, the, the phone of the future, I think, is going to have uh, artificial intelligence in it, uh, it's going to be analyzing your behavior all the time. It's going to be optimizing the phone continuously. It, it will find the apps that you need or create them. So uh, we got a long, long way to go, uh, but I, uh, uh, the, the potential of the phone, uh, first of all, in education, uh, second of all, in uh, healthcare, uh, third of all, in just making uh, our society more efficient. Uh, is uh, uh, enormous, uh, and I'm very proud that I made a very tiny contribution to that introduction. Sorry, Elias, for that long. No, yeah. that was perfect. I don't know if I would call your contribution tiny. Um, it was pretty massive, considering every single one of us more than likely uh, use your invention in our everyday lives. I uh, had a question from one of the students in Florida. They wanted to know, can you... Um, Kind of, you know, and I know it might be hard to briefly explain, but can you briefly explain the process of how did you go about uh, creating the phone? And then if you could talk to the kids about the two prototypes um, when you first made the, the first call. Sure. Well, you, you should know that the vision of uh, the importance of personal communications uh, started even before the thought of a uh, what we now call a cell phone, uh, because the uh, the superintendent of police of, of the Chicago Police Department, a guy named Orlando Wilson, uh, approached us. And, uh, policemen, as you know, uh, use uh, two-way radios 
uh, to organize their uh, resources. Uh, and he was concerned that he wanted his police officers to be in the community. He wanted them to work closely with people to, to solve people's problems. Uh, and yet in order to communicate, they were stuck in their cars because all they had were uh, two-way radios that were built into the cars. And uh, so we created a system for him where the police officer wore the radio on his body. He had an antenna on his shoulder. Uh, and so when he was in the car, he could uh, communicate. And when he was out on the street, he could communicate. And of course, in order to do that, we had to have what we call cells. So we knew that was going to happen. Then along comes the bell system, uh, which you guys don't remember. Uh, but this was a monopoly that uh, would rent you a, a, a wired phone, uh, but they wouldn't let you own it. Uh, and they were the only ones you could get service from. And they came and said, we just invented cellular uh, and uh, we are going to have a monopoly of this. And our def definition of a cellular phone is a car phone. And we thought that was ridiculous. Uh, and we took uh, the biggest company in the world on Motorola. It was a little company then. Uh, and uh, got our, uh, after a, a battle that lasted some 13 or 14 years, uh, we got our government, uh, first of all, to say there is not going to be a monopoly. And second of all, that the industry is going to pick the service. And the service ended, of course, as you know, being portable service. And we changed the whole nature of what a telephone call was. Because before the cell phone, when you made a phone call, you were calling a location, a place, somebody's house, a business. And as you know today, when you make a cell phone call, you're calling a person. That's a huge, huge difference. Uh, and uh, as I said before, we think the cellular revolution is just beginning. That's wonderful. It certainly is. And uh, we have a question from all the way from one of our students across the world in Italy. And this is Gabrielle. Uh, Gabrielle, you should be able to unmute. You had a really good question. Go ahead. Hi, nice to meet you. My question is, what's your definition of innovation? That's a hard one. <laughs> I'll tell you what my definition of technology is because I've been thinking about it a long time. Uh, technology is the application of science to create products and services that make people's lives better. If you think about that, the definition, the most important part of that is the people part. So uh, when you talk about innovation, innovation is doing something uh, new and better. Uh, uh, the, uh, if it captures the idea of you are trying to improve the human experience, uh, then I think you're uh, uh, capturing the, the essence of the whole thing, the word invention, the word innovation. Uh, you're doing something new and improving the human experience. What do you think of that, Gabriel? Yeah, I think he's right. Well, I'd love, I would love for you to argue with me, but if you, if <laughs> you think, were all agreeing with you, no one's going to be arguing, <laughs> arguing. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's interesting that you brought that up because we had um, one of our students in Florida, they wanted to know what does it feel like to make a product that no one had ever made before you came along? Well, you should know that uh, you, when you do a historical experience, like making that first phone call, you would think that you would know it was a historical experience, uh, experience. but I uh, have to tell you the only thing that I was thinking of when I was standing on the streets of New York, and there were only two of these portable phones in existence, and they were hand-wired, they were extraordinarily unreliable. All I could think about is, boy, I hope this thing works. So <laughs> I wasn't thinking about history, and I wasn't thinking about uh, the future of, of personal communications. Uh, I was just trying to do a successful uh, demonstration. Unfortunately, uh, that demonstration was successful. Uh, and uh, the first phone call I was doing uh, in front of the New York Hilton was to a newspaper reporter. Ultimately, 
we uh, did that demonstration to hundreds of people in our government, uh, in Congress, uh, and we ended up persuading them that we had the right idea, that the uh, we want to have a competitive business, which we do today, as you know, uh, with uh, uh, at least three carriers, and sometimes a lot more, uh, and that the uh, future was going to be personal communications, people talking to other people. That's so important. Absolutely. And uh, just for kind of reference, around how much did each of those uh, prototypes cost? Oh, it's hard to <laughs> put a number on. Let me tell you, uh, because you, you uh, argued with me about calling my contribution tiny. The, uh, in order to build those phones and to demonstrate them, we pretty much had to shut down all research and development and focus everybody on that. We had more than 20 people just working uh, on the phone itself. We had a bunch of people working on the cell sites, uh, even details like the integrated circuits that made this thing work uh, uh, required us going out to other parts uh, of uh, Motorola. So the management of Motorola it literally bet the company that someday they would be able to make uh, enough cell phones uh, to uh, earn some uh, revenues and profits. And that took 14 years. And, and before we succeeded, in getting uh, actually shipping a phone, Motorola spent a hundred million dollars of of nineteen seventy dollars, which would be more like a billion dollars today. So uh, the, you could not measure the value of those two phones from that. Um, that must have been a lot of pressure. I I can't imagine having that much pressure. And you know. Um, Congratulations on all your awards. I don't know if the students here looked at some of his awards, but you know, Time Magazine naming you one of the top 100 inventors in history. Uh, that's absolutely astounding. And you know, we are absolutely honored to be able to connect with you. One of our, our students, he's in uh, Martinique um, in the Caribbean, and he messaged and wanted to know, um, where did you get your inspiration from when you create an invention where does it come? Can you talk about the need and trying to meet uh, that need? Well, uh, you know, I, I try to express that uh, in my uh, book. Uh, it, it starts out with, first of all, uh, 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 being curious. Uh, I've always had that problem. I, I desperately have wanted to know how everything works. Uh, only in recent years did I realize that I was never going to know that. Uh, I, I uh, took a stab at, uh, at quantum physics uh, several months ago, and I decided that maybe quantum uh, 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 physics is not going to be my strength, and that I tried out blockchain. I don't know how many of you have tried to figure out what blockchain is, so I took that off the thing. So it, it all uh, begins with it, and being curious uh, and having a vivid imagination, uh, and I've uh, been in uh, uh, interested in uh, science fiction and from the time that I could uh, read. Uh, I have a vivid imagination. Uh, and by the way, I still do. So you have to be kind of very open-minded to be an innovator uh, and an inventor. Uh, but uh, the biggest issue is building up confidence in yourself and realizing that, uh, that the world is evolving uh, things are changing, uh, and there is an opportunity for everybody to participate in that change. So not everybody's going to be an inventor, <clears throat> not everybody will be an innovator, uh, but the opportunities are endless. We are just at the beginning uh, of uh, revolution in communications and, uh, and hopefully uh, in the ability of, of humans to get along with each other. Absolutely, and that's wonderful advice. We have a, a question from Noah here in Nevada, and he wanted to know about how long did it take to make the prototype for the first cellular phone? Well, the story is that we did it in three months, that I uh, put a team together. I had the idea in November of uh, 1972, and by the time I had the team together of the designers and the engineers, it was the beginning of the year, and by uh, uh, March, we actually had a phone built. 
but you should know that the uh, in order to build that uh, phone, we had to reach out to all parts of our company. Uh, people had been working on uh, large-scale integrated circuits, uh, which we needed because we were now dealing with hundreds of radio channels, not just uh, one or two. Uh, even the antennas uh, were uh, new because we were dealing with new frequency bands. Uh, we had to build a device that could let you talk and listen at the same time. Uh, that device in, in a two-way radio uh, in a uh, car uh, was a device about the size of your fist. Now we had to make that in a, a fraction of a cubic inch. So a lot of these things we had been working on for years. The actual putting it on the phone, uh, these guys worked day and night for three months, uh, and that's just how long it took them. And uh, we thank you and your team's efforts. Um, so before we let you go, the, the final question, is there any advice that you could give? Um, you know, I, I know that uh, you've been in the game as far as creating and inventing for a very long time, and you've changed the world with your innovation. What kind of advice would you have for these kids as they go off into the world, those that want to become engineers and want to um, make the world a better place? Well, I, this is going to sound possibly uh, trivial to you, uh, but the most important thing in your life is going to be continuing to learn the rest of your life. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how how important that is. Uh, this is and this isn't just an opinion; it's scientifically uh, uh, validated by the evidence that learning is a skill that has to be practiced. And if you stop learning, you lose the ability to learn. If that isn't the scariest thing in, in the world, I, I don't know what is. And I'm really serious. Uh, that if you decide that you know as much as you need to know, you don't have to learn anything new, uh, after a year or two, you won't be able to learn anything new. And I'm, uh, uh, I think you're all aware of the fact uh, that I'm uh, 93 years old. Uh, fortunately, uh, our neurons do not deteriorate like the rest of our bodies do. There is no reason why you can't continue to be curious, to learn, to build your skills more and more uh, every year and to continue growing. And if you don't that, you're not going to keep up with the world and you're not going to be a leader uh, in all these opportunities that I talked about. And the, the, uh, the opportunities are endless. Every one of you has been born at an optimum time uh, in the world to exercise your potential. Uh, I wish you the best of luck, but it's not because the, if you fail, it's not going to be because the opportunities are not there because they really are. There are so many ways uh, that you can uh, uh, succeed in the future. Uh, and it's a real privilege to have talked to, I wish we had more time. I could, I could do this endlessly.